not be afraid of life. Believe that life is worth living and your belief will help to create the fact. These are words of American philosopher William James. Welcome, my friends, to Makamba. Makamba what? Life. Makamba Life. <laughs> Today we have a distinguished businesswoman and lawyer, Kunyalala Mapisa. Ooh, I was looking at your, at your bio, at your CV. You have done so much. I'll let you speak for yourself. Uh, Kunyalala, welcome Thank you. to Makamba, Makamba Life. So who is Kunyalala Mapisa? Um, I consider myself to be a very adventurous human being. Um, I don't believe I conform to any particular way of doing things and way of believing. Um, I don't structure myself according to how, um, you know, I often find that um, in life you're supposed to go to school and then become this and become that. Um, I believe that, um, you know, one has to go out and find themselves and define themselves within the space that they find themselves in. Uh, so I often my, describe myself as a very unconventional person. Um, and so, you know, I professionally I'm a lawyer, I'm an attorney. I did uh, measures and acquisitions, competition law, um, and I left to join Ernst & Young, which is a, an accounting firm. I was in their business development unit and I was um, head of emerging markets, um, and I found that, um, you know, at the end of the day, as much as I enjoyed the work that I did, as much as I enjoyed the people that I worked with, I always just thought that there was more to life than what I was doing, and I wanted to go out there and find out um, what it's about, and so I did, and um, I continued to find out. Uh, it's fun a lot of the times, it's not so much fun sometimes. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, life is what you make it, and mm -hmm. I try to, to do just that. So would you say m making that leap from the corporate sector into uh, self-employment mm -hmm. was not difficult for you? No. It's nothing you get dreamless, no, I th I sleepless think, nights about? And I think that's why I say that um, I'm an unconventional person, because for a lot of people that becomes the biggest decision in their lives, and it becomes the biggest nightmare oh my God, tomorrow I'm going to, at the end of the month, I'm not going to have a salary, what's going to happen? I found myself never thinking about those issues. Mm -hmm. I found myself just believing that this is part of the, the, the journey that I'm walking. Um, this is what part of what I'm supposed to do. It, it's not even something that I blinked to make a decision mm -hmm. on whether I wanted to leave or I didn't want to leave. So it's, um, to the extent that um, it's considered to be a very difficult decision, for me it was not. Because I always knew that the nature of who I am did not allow me to work within a structured environment where I get told what to do because I, I like the freedom of uh, making a decision of what I want to do, how I want to interpret what I come, what comes before me and what I want to do with what comes uh, before me. And so um, that has allowed me to to be able to do so many varied things because the nature of my profession was such that I came across so many different um, you know, businesses. I mean, when I was doing uh, competition law, for example, um, you know, you analyze different measures ac across different industries. So I can tell you about the funeral business just as uh, competently as I can tell you something about mining because I have had to delve into those issues in great detail when we're doing an acquisition of one, you know, funeral business acquiring another. It's, it's quite morbid, I know, but... Mm. Uh, you sort of chase after everything that comes to your desk or you are clearly defined that you, you pursue mining opportunities, trading opportunities. Would you like to share with us? Um, I think the, in terms of uh, the sectors that, we, that, 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 that are of interest to me, I always found that infrastructure development is something that I understood. Um, because for me, it's also not just about the industry itself. It's about what it is that you are trying to achieve and what you do or what you can potentially achieve. Because I have tried to, um, to marry my business endeavors with what I believe should be my, pur my purpose and, my, uh, uh, and, and what I'm destined to do. And uh, it's not just about lining one's pocket, but it's about saying that, uh, you know, what responsibility do you have towards um, other human beings? What responsibility 
practices do you have um, towards your environment, the space that you're in? Um, so I found that, um, for example, when I left uh, corporate, I went to the DRC, mm -hmm. places I know. Um, Very rich country. One, one of the richest in the world. Of, certainly one of the richest, yeah. richest in the country. Endowed um, with all kinds of uh, resources, water, absolutely. wildlife, minerals. Um, but also sometimes a business nightmare. Um, but, you know, what, what I went to, to do there was um, we, develop a, we developed a toll road project. Um, and, you know, I believe... Sorry, toll road? Between, between which uh, cities or which provinces? Um, it was a toll road between um, a small town in the southeastern part of the DRC called Kasenga, mm -hmm. um, connecting it to, to the Zambian uh, road network. Um, is so that in Katanga province? Yeah, that was in, in the old Katanga, Katanga province, province, which has yes. since been subdivided into, into several, I think there are four now, and then that particular space now falls into a different province, but it's part of the out of the old greater um, Katanga provinces. So listening to you, most of your business is in Africa, maybe in the in the southern and central hemispheres of Africa. Mm -hmm. What what are the challenges, the real challenges of doing a cross border business in Africa? Um, the first major hurdle is um, you know what I've already alluded to with regards to the legislative environment that allows for smooth transacting. Do you, um, you find that this differs vastly between English speaking and French speaking, or there is a commonality of uh, the challenges? I think you have got more de the, in English. Certainly, Southern Africa, you have a lot of uh, the business infrastructure is fairly well developed. Systems and processes and procedures are fairly well developed. Mm. Um, I can't speak for all of French speaking Africa. Um, certainly, my experience in the DRC is that there is a lot that still needs to be done. Um, I've uh, spent a little bit of time in Ivory Coast, and uh, they have a fairly, um, certainly compared to the DRC, mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's a much more, m much more developed environment. Um, so, you know, that is one of the main challenges, the, f the first one. Um, travel? I think the second thing is, that is travel. It's not very easy to travel in, uh, in, in Africa, in fact. Mm -hmm. Uh, only yesterday I was trying to book a flight to, uh, to, to, to Morocco where there is the, the Mo Ibrahim uh, weekend which is coming up sometime in April and um, to book a flight to, to Marrakesh is like you have to fly through Europe. Yes. I'm going there for two days and I have to fly one, one direction for 19 hours. I cancelled the trip because I said this doesn't make sense. I'm going to travel for 19 yeah. hours to go spend two days and then travel back by another yeah. 19 hours. That that just becomes very, very difficult. But I think um, in most of Southern Africa, um, it has become, you know, SAA has tried. I mean, you can fly directly to a lot of destinations. Mm -hmm. Certainly the destinations that I've had to spend a lot of time in, I've been able to fly directly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kenyan Airways also, uh, Ethiopian Airways, you are able to, um, you are able to move around. Um, the other issue, obviously, is language. Yes. Uh, my French is terrible. I understand the now what's happening, so... <laughs>
Can, can it be verified? Wow. Uh, can it be verified? Uh, yes. Um, you know, running an association is very difficult mm -hmm. because uh, the, you know there are multi layers to what it is that you must do. Uh, first of all, it was an ad advocacy. Um, it's, a, it's an advocacy um, tool through which we are advocating for, um, for 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 the empowerment of women or advocating for creating an environment that allows women to be able to do what they, they, you know, they might do or to reach their, their potential. So how do you measure um, is it, is effectiveness? It, is it closely affiliated to the Department of Trade? Are you recognized um, by them? Yes, Okay. we definitely work with them. I mean, one of our advocacy tools was a, a, a report that is called the South African Women in Leadership Census, mm. which um, looks at the number of women who are enlisted companies in, uh, in, in, in South Africa. If you say that uh, listed companies or the, 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 the big companies control plus minus 80-90% of the South African economy, understanding the women's positions within um, that environment will then say what is the share of women's voice within the bigger South African economy. So the percentage so, of women sitting, say, on J, uh, SE listed, listed companies, companies what, what would it be at the moment? Um, I think that uh, the last report that was done, which was in 2015, I think you are you are looking at uh, really very small figures. I think you are talking about 10 percent here, 11 percent mm. here. You know, so it's not it's nowhere near. Uh, are you aware of any 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 programs, especially from? We always say government, but because government is responsible for for um, for creating an enabling environment. Yeah, yeah. Do you know if there's any legislation that has been passed? To accelerate this, the rapid um, you know movement of women into the main sector. Yeah, I think I think the whole um, you know BE legislation, for example, even though this is specific uh, to, to black people, the way it's structured is such that it encourages uh, businesses to be accountable in that respect in terms of understanding um, you know where women's positions are within within a corporate environment. Uh, employment equity legislation certainly. Um, also gives, uh, you know, in, enforces that uh, responsibility and accountability on the part of companies to ensure that they are able to uh, to reach the requisite uh, numbers and, 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 and positions in as far as uh, empowerment is concerned. Whether that is happening at the speed at which it should happen, um, the answer is no, definitely, because we wouldn't be having this conversation otherwise. Mm. Um, and it's, it's a, the reason for that is uh, it's, a, it's different. Um, there are different reasons. I mean, in some cases, it's a clear unwillingness. You can see when companies are unwilling because you get issues like we don't have enough women. I believe we are enough. Um, it's just the enough women qualified. Qualified, yes. Yeah, uh, I've, I've always <laughs> said the, the the qualification of a woman. I mean, the, the just the instinct from the moment you know a baby is conceived, that whole process yeah. of nurturing, you know, pregnancy, it's, 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 it's incredible. Yeah. You know, it's qualification enough. If, yeah. if one can go through that process, yeah. they can be literally trusted with anything. Do that. Okay, so, I'm sure when you were contacted for this interview, you must have said to yourself, I hope James asks me about that. Is there something that you specifically want to say for the benefit of our viewers? Um, yes, the African Leadership Institute, of which I'm uh, Fellow, um, it's a, it's an institute that was uh, that is founded by Oxford University in partnership with uh, uh, Desmond Tutu, who is uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who is the, the, the patron of the of the institute. And the really at the core of that is about developing African leadership that is accountable, a leadership that is uh, responsive to the people, a leadership that is um, that is ethically driven. Um, and it's something that I would like to see as many people be a part of um, as, as, as possible because at the end of the day... Uh, how do we become uh, participants of that? Uh, you apply. Mm -hmm. um, I think every year, I think a few weeks ago, uh, we just uh, done the class of 2017. Uh, we'll be able to look at that and uh, uh, you know, as many young people that are, you know, that aspire to be good leaders on the continent, regardless of what, you know, the nature of your field, it could be 
in politics, in business, in, in, in civil society. It's really just about saying, as Africans, we need to be accountable, we need to be responsive, we need to be responsible. Um, and, um, and I think it's a fantastic program, and it has produced some, or put together some of the, the most inspiring um, young Africans, and I'm just always grateful every day that I'm And how is the Archbishop these days? And ah, I enjoy his chuckle, okay. his laugh. <laughs> how is that he? How is, is he? How is his health yes, these uh, days? Is he? Well, unfortunately, is he much better. Uh, I, I'm not sure because he's not. Um, we haven't been able to to see him because, you know, the the family has closed in, understandably so, because his health has not been what it used to be. We pray to God um, that. Uh, we pray that he gets better. He gets so, better. He's yeah. um, one of the. He's amazing. An amazing human yeah. being. I have had the uh, yeah. opportunity to interact with him. Yes. So they say life is what you make it. We would like you to leave leave us with some words. My philosophy of life is that life is what you make it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> no, for putting us this time on Makaba Life.